Hello, and welcome to episode 31 of Four Random Books, coincidentally coming out on the 31st of March 2021. I didn't plan it this way, but it, it's come out. And today's topic... The Conduct of War. Yeah, The Conduct of War. I'll start off with this one. To the Last Round, written by Andrew Salmon, the epic British stand on the Imjin River, Korea, 1951. One of my good colleagues, Drac, likes to talk, uh, well, occasionally talks about... um. Someone he knows who was involved in the Korean War and how much machine gun fire actually they took, uh, they, they, uh, they used, how, much, how many machine gun bullets they fired and how full or filled up the tanks would be with machine gun rounds. And it really does paint a very interesting picture when you're thinking about that. Now. Due to the shortage of men, the sector's dominant feature, the 675 meter high Snowden sized mountain Kamaksan, was unmanned. This left a two mile wide hole in the front between the left hand company of the Fusiliers X and the right hand company of the Glossers B. While artillery, mortars, and even Vickers could, in theory, cover the empty zone, against an enemy who was a master of camouflage, night movement infiltration, infiltration it was a perilous gap to leave. If they had had one, the Chinese could have had a driven and armoured division between us and the Fusiliers, said Private Sam Mercer. It was no exaggeration. There were two key lines of communication in the British sector. The major one was Route 11, a track running north-south along a valley parallel to the MSR. About 10 miles south of the river, this route turned southeast to link up with the MSR. Branching west off Route 11 was a narrow, very narrow track, Route 57 known as 5Y or 5 Yankee. It led through a narrow defile on the hills to the Gloucester's positions from the rear, through the township of Chokosong and across the Imjin, via fjord on the north. For the soldiers settling into this line, it was not just evidence of previous fighting. The Chinese corpses on Kamak San and Ban and fighting positions throughout the sector that communicated the strategic significance of their location. There were echoes of even older at battles. The Gloucester's A Company occupied a hill that was marked on maps as Castle Site, Nothing remained of stronghold, but this had been a defensive position since the Shilla dynasty. The ford it overlooked was dubbed Gloucester Crossing, and maps show another castle site to the northwest. On the brigade's eastern flank, the rifles would soon discover a hill with extant medieval fortifications. Rumour had it that Genghis Khan's hordes had once crossed the engine. For all that, though, with the Chinese out of contact, the mission was vague. Most soldiers assumed they would soon resume their northward push. I can only describe it as a temporary position. It wasn't a fully prepared defensive position, Fort One. It was the kind of position from which we could continue to advance further north. Though, as far as we know, no further plans were cooking. We were still mentally in forward gear, wrote Lieutenant Colonel Maris Young, 45 Field Regiment's commander. The widely dispersed companies sighted themselves for all round the fence on their scrubby brown hills. In January at, uh, at Pine Tech, South Seoul, the Britannians had fortified themselves. The Gloucesters had dug communication trenches and under underground sleeping combination. On the engine, most infantry positions were the kind that would be dug in a single day. Presum previously, we had dug in more, said gunner Bob Nichols of 170, 170 Mortar, his three-man FO's forward, ob ob uh, forward observation or unit team was uh, with the fuselage. No mines were laid, though some units set up trip flares and armed grenades in tins. If someone kicked it, it would go off as booby traps. Soldiers dug one or two man slit trenches. Some were only knee deep, as in certain areas, spades stuck, struck sandstone or granite a couple of feet down. There were no sandbags, so parapets of compacted earth or rocks were raised. There were a few bunkers and little wire, just a few rolls strung here and there, covering obvious approaches at angle height. The men erected their bivy tents behind, next to, or even over their slits. It is a good book. Fighting for Peace. Lessons from, for Bo uh, lessons from Bosnia. By General Sir Michael Rose. Pictures in here, like there are in that one.
The Serbs constantly protested about their hostile treatment at the hands of the international community and demanded airstrikes against the Bosnian army for violating NATO and the NATO ultimatum. In return, we demanded that they respect the Geneva Agreement regarding the freedom of movement for UN troops and stopped their attacks on civilians. Although Mladic was interested in the demilitarization of Sarajevo, as this released thousands of troops from the trenches around the city for deployment elsewhere, he demanded the Bosnians would also have to demilitarize. We told them the Bosnian government would never accept this, as Sarajevo was their capital city, but the Serbs persisted with this precondition. Never understood why they did so, as it would have been in their interest for the Bosnian troops to remain in Sarajevo, rather than reinforce their units elsewhere. Maladek was also making it increasingly difficult for me to move around Bosnia. Returning from a visit to a Canadian position near Vosonko on 7th of August, we were ambushed by a Serb parliamentary force armed with anti-tank weapons and machine guns. I told Goose to stop and got out the Range Rover to demand explanation from the Serb commander. He told us that we were illegally on Bosnian Serb territory and were under arrest. I replied that as UN profile commander, I was entitled to go anywhere I wanted. Pointing at Mike Steinley, he claimed that one of his soldiers had recognized him as a Muslim, being a Muslim taxi driver from Zucco, and that he was a spy. Mike, in translating this, looked furious at being called a Muslim, implied that he was as good as Serb as anyone. He then produced a photograph of his grandfather dressed in royalist Serb uniform to prove it. What's it going on? I noticed Goose and the rest of the escort slowly moving into fire positions, and I actually heard Colonel Gordon Rudd, who was out for the US, cock his gun. The Serbs responded by taking up positions in the ditches on each side of the road. In Gronis, I told the Serb commander that I would surely be speaking and be seeing Maladic, that I would report to him for his discourtesy. The UN was in Bosnia by invitation of both sides to bring about peace. Saying this, I then launched into my well-rehearsed lecture on the principles of peacekeeping. The commander was a sinister man with hard eyes and a scarred face who looked uneasy at the mention of Maladic. After some time, when I demanded to know if he understood what I was saying, he said rather lamely that he was not authorized to make a statement. I told him that in that case, he should make a personal comment. By then, his soldiers had left their positions and were listening to debate. In the end, they, to their, to, in their commander, much to their disappointment, cut the discussion short and sunk off down the road, mumbling to himself. On our return to Sarajevo, Gordon Rudd t- turned to me and said, Next time I come out of you, General, I'm going to cock my gun before I leave the residency. <laughs> when I asked Bruce what he would have done if it had come to fight, he replied cheerfully, Well, I was going to chuck you my rifle and call on you to lead the attack. <laughs> At the end of the month, I took General Wesley Park Clark, head of operations in the Pentagon, to see Mladic in Bajalunka. I was told before his arrival that he had great influence in Washington, being like President Clinton from Little Rock, Arkansas, and he had also been Oxford president. He was clever, sharp, and extremely confident. He told me that while he understood the UN arguments about lift and strike policy, he wished to deliver a message to Mladic that he would leave him in no doubt what his fate would be if the Bosnian Serbs did not sign up to contact group plan. He would be confronted by the military might of the US. Before we left for Bajaluka, I warned Wes, as he was generally known, that Maladic was highly manipulative and that he should not be underestimated. I told him to avoid smiling in Maladic's presence, as it did no one good to be seen fraternizing with him. I told Wes that at some point a reporter would probably ambush him, and that he should have a statement prepared which he should stick to, whatever the circumstances. Sadly for Wes, Bosnia was not the Gulf War. The rules of the game were subtler. He turned out to be ill-equipped to deal with the brooding, a brutal cunning of a man like Maladic. He started off by lecturing Maladic on the superpower status of the US, telling him that in the near future the US would start arming the Bosnian army. He asked what the Bosnian Serbs' reaction would be to this. Maladic reacted angrily, launching into a violent trade. He told Wes that if the US entered the war on behalf of Muslims, Bosnia would cease to exist. The Serbs were a fighting nation who had never been subdued, no matter how great the enemy. Under Tito, they had prepared themselves well for war against a foreign aggressor. They believed in their nation and would expand, uh, spend the last drop of blood fighting for it. His father and grandfather had died in the war, and he had lost his only daughter in civil war in Bosnia. The Americans were backing a fascist fundamentalist regime. The US were military strong, but did not have a stomach for war. They had been demonstrating in Vietnam. They would be war, but the clock was already ticking, and the Serbs would be the victors. In the end, the US would, not, would have to resort to nuclear weapons. It was naval waste to think the Serbs would surrender their lands on which so much Serb blood had been spilled, just to save Clinton's skin. Soon everyone would be in the enemy of the Serbs, and Maladic would destroy them all, from General Rose to the last man. While Maladic was hurling these statements across the table, his face became muffled with a sort of rage. His brow darkened, his eyes flashed with fury and spittled food from his lips. He repeatedly struck the table with his fist and menacingly stabbed the air with his podgy fingers. Behind him, burly bodyguards carrying machine pistols increased the atmosphere of intimidation. Wes seemed devastated that his carefully crafted opening statement had produced such a violent reaction, and several times during the onslaught he put his head in his hands and looked down at the table. When he did Maladic, without stopping his stride, would grin cheerfully at me and once slowly wound a forefinger round the little finger of his other hand in a gesture of total contempt. It was horrible to watch. In an effort to calm him down and showing less confidence than before, Wes said that he certainly respected the Serbs as fighting people. He closely studied the achievements of the Bosnian Serb army and agreed Maladic had not been exaggerating when he described the consequence of waging war against the Serbs. He had come to prevent war and to remind Maladic how important it was that a path to peace be found. Time was short, and the Bosnian Serb leaders 
needed to come forward with proposals. The international community needed a gesture from Serbs. Responding to Wesley's new approach, Mladic altered his own demona, lowering his voice. A sensible discussion then took place about the reaction of Serbs to proposals made by, uh, by the contact group. The me as the meeting came to close, Mladic, without obviously doing so, changed the subject and began kind of discussing, discussing U.S. military uniform. He said it was evident to him that the armed arms embargo was already being in all my Americans, America as he had captured some Bosnian soldiers wearing uniforms made in the US. He expressed a liking for US Army battle fatigues and particularly admired Wes's cap with its free silver stars. I said this, he took his own hat and gave it to Wes. He was clearly delighted to be offered some sort of olive branch. Taking him out his hat, he put it on, and in turn put on the American's hat. Manak announced lunch and walked with Wes to the door. As they emerged from the room, television cameras appeared, the trap had been sprung. Wes appeared not to notice that he'd been filmed and continued to laugh and joke Maladic as we went to lunch. At the end of lunch, Maladic, who was by now bubbling good humor, said, Look, I mean no fear. I disarmed myself from it. You can have my pistol. So saying, he took his pistol proposal and presented it to Maladic, uh, Wes. On it were engraved words from General Maladic. We were appalled. As we left back at Banjalunka, one of Wes's aides asked Colonel Gordon Rudd, who had been present meeting, Did the general do wrong? Yep, he replied Gordon in a man a few words. He did wrong. Next day, a photograph of General Clark appeared in West Washington Post wearing Maladic's hat. Subtlety, nuance. The Conduct of War, 1789-1961, by Major General J.F.C. Fuller. Yeah. Theorists like to write history books. They really do. Sometimes they even write good ones. The Scores and Concords. From the close of the Franco-Prussian War until his dismissal in March 1890, Bismarck's policy was to stabilize the peace Germany had won, and to assure it he sent out to win uh, the friendship of Russia and in order to isolate France. In 1879, he concluded with Austria a defensive treaty known as the Dual Alliance, which two, later, uh, two years later was joined by Italy, which was outraged by the French occupation, occupation of Tunisia. The Dual Alliance then became the Triple Alliance. In 1888, William II succeeded to the German throne. Two years later, he dismissed Bismarck, and France, alarmed by his capricious and bellicose behaviour, entered into negotiations with Russia, which between 1893 and 1895 matured into a defensive agreement, the New Dual Alliance. Thus, two, great, uh, two opposing alliances came to being. Nevertheless, as long as Great Britain was not party to either, the peace of Europe remained firm. Unfortunately, this happy situation was not to last, because the rapid expansion of German overseas trade and the growth of merchant service increasingly challenged British commerce. Further, in order to protect German overseas trade and catch up with France's naval preponderance, in 1898, the German and the Kaiser increased the size of the German navy, and in 1900, when Britain was occupied in South Africa, he did so again. This led to uproar in British press. Yeah. Sorry, but... Germany whips, and I mean this in the nicest way, whips France many times in a land war. They know the British will not get involved unless someone tries to take control of the whole of Belgium and the whole of Europe, or if someone tries to build a navy to face them. There is only one reason you build a navy if you're Germany at this time. You do not have a massive empire around the world. You build it because you want a massive empire. And to get a massive empire, you have to challenge the biggest power of all, which is Britain. You do not build a navy to challenge France when you have a land border with them and a massive army. That is just false advertising. Royal Navy. 1930 to 2000, Innovation and Defense, by edited by Richard Harding. This is a sort of slightly different tack, and it's quite an interesting one. It has chapters by Richard Harding, Philip Pugh, Richard, uh, David Hobbs, <laughs> Lewis Johnman and Hugh Murphy, W.J.R. Garner, Malcolm Lewin Jones, Anthony Gorst, Eric Grove, Ian Speller, Norman Freeman. And Norman Freeman does electronics in the Royal Navy, which is a really quite an interesting chapter. But I haven't talked so far about CBA01 and Anthony Gorst, so that's where I'm going to, which is, starts on page 170, but if I remember correctly, it's 174 I want. Yes. Design commences. Design work on CBA01 
it really began with the meeting of the naval staff and ship department on the 1st of 10th of June 1960. This defined the task of the new carriers being to operate strike and reconnaissance aircraft against land and sea targets and provide air defense to the fleet and ground forces. Aircraft dimensions overall had grown to 70 foot for both the wingspan and fuselage length, with a height of 23 foot, and folding to 30 foot, 64 foot, and 19 foot, 6 inches, respectively. A minimum of 42 aircraft, including ancillary aircraft and helicopters, were to be embarked, although the direction plans felt strongly that the complement of 32 fighter strike aircraft was inadequate to meet the defined tasks. It was not, however, merely a question of increasing the aircraft to the complement by increasing the size of the carrier. Itself, as an extrinsic factors, immediately began to constrain the new carrier. Anything above 45,000 tons would raise problems with dockyard facilities, particularly those at the Portsmouth and Gibraltar, as well as running into political difficulties if the Navy was seen to be asking for replacement carriers significantly larger than HMS Eagle and HMS Ark Royal. It was agreed that the problem was therefore to design a ship as large as possible in order to take the maximum number of aircraft and as small as possible in order to fit into the maximum number of docks. That strategy. At the same time, financial considerations also came into play. As above 45,000 tons, all costs concerned with ships rise rapidly. The Director General of Ships, A.J. Sims, was nevertheless instructed to, instructed to investigate designs below 45,000 tons and up to 55,000 tons. It was also suggested that a maximum speed of 28 knots would suffice as this would allow a free shaft layout that was likely to be considerably cheaper than the four shafts required to produce the desirable 30 knots fleet speed. From the beginning of the process, the constraints of size and cost began to shape the design. Only one month later, Sims rounded sounded the first of the many notes of cautions, pointing out that a ship of under 45,000 tons, some of the staff requirements now being discussed, cannot be met. He was understandably anxious to avoid repeating earlier experiences where the problem has been to meet an aircraft carrier's a relatively modified size, modest size, staff requirements which approach those for much larger American aircraft carriers. It was little wonder, then, that the early design studies conducted in the ship department showed an inexorable rise in size and cost as staff requirements were added to meet the desire of the various departments of the naval staff. By 19, in November 1960, it was concluded that the required number of aircraft embarked in an aircraft carrier task group of two ships to provide air support for land and naval forces deployed beyond the limits of the land base was 64 strike reconnaissance and fighter aircraft an increase of 50% in the fixed-wing aircraft department to 48 for each carrier. Moreover, it was now thought desirable by DOR that at least two, and preferably four, surface-to-air guided weapon systems, the American Tata systems in absence of any suitable British weapon, should be fitted both for self-defense but also to maximize the number of such systems at sea of the fleet. DOR also specified a new frequency scanning, three-dimensional air search radar, and a comprehensive ASW sensor suite, while four anti-submarine hunter-killer single-package helicopters were to be carried. This is a very cool book, edited by Richard Harmony Harding, The Royal Navy, 1930 to 2000. And thank you for staying tuned to episode 31 of Four Random Books. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you like, subscribe, press the little bell button. And, well, if you fancy becoming a patron, there's also a link to that down below. Thank you. Take care. How can I say?